Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. What would you trust more? <laughs> a CEO with a goatee or a CEO with this? Goatee, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You could just be a fat miner if you're a winner life yet, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like your handlebars are a bit more ruthless, but cowboys might work for like if you're in WA. Or goatee something. is just, yeah, fat men have goatees because it covers their it hides a double chin. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. More trustable. More trustable. <laughs> All right, Matt. So today we're talking, uh, we're answering questions actually. We've got a, a bucket load that have been sent through, so I don't know if we'll be able to get through them all. But um, if you want to send us a question, if you want to send Drew or I a question uh, or some feedback for the podcast, you can head to any of the RASC websites and there's a link in the menu that says, ask a question. <laughs> so uh, it's it's really simple and you can actually choose from any of the podcasts or wherever you want it to be answered so it doesn't have to be this podcast but if you do want it to be this podcast it has to be the Australian Investors Podcast and then we'll go through and we keep it fun uh, there are some I ask you when you go through that um, to give us a fun name so there have been a few of those thrown in the mix um, one of them I did a test I to, <laughs> forgot to exclude that one from the list um, but we're going to cover questions. We're talking about some listed stocks, like we've got like Woodside, uh, a company I don't follow very closely, which is Infratil. Really, still don't follow it that well. Got Super some interesting, is it? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you know something about it because I don't know much. Um, but there's a heap of questions uh, for everything from portfolio construction, retirement, through to ETFs in individual companies. So, uh, if you want to ask a question, please like, jump into jump into those links. Make it a bit of fun, and uh, we'll read it out. I'm hoping that we can do this more regularly, mate. So. Yeah, keen uh, to. Yeah, it uh, it would be a bit of fun. Thinking calling it two cents, <laughs> I don't know, but it's uh it's good because you know we got sometimes when you're behind the mic, and you think, well, what can we do as an episode? What would people what are in- people interested in right now? We just don't know. So, like some of these ETFs that have come through are like res- in response to a lot of marketing. So people want to know the answer to that. So we'll cover those. Anyway, enough of my fluffing around, mate. I mean, I get all these types of questions every day as an advisor. Yeah. Clients or potential clients. That's why you write the daily article, right? Essentially, yeah. If, you know, it sounds like it's a lot of work, but about half an hour a day, you capture everything that's happening in global markets and you're able to kind of answer queries about individual companies before they ever come up. Yeah. Which is so handy because otherwise you just answer the same thing a few times. Exactly. Um, Okay, cool. So Drew's daily articles, you can read them on the Inside Network. You can read them. Um, on the RAS websites, wherever you get your news. So the first question comes from hoping to make millions and they say WDS, which is the ticker symbol for Woodside Group. Despite the growth after 2020, long-term, it's not showing any growth since late 2009. Is Woodside Group still a good buy for the long-term, i.e. five to 10 years if I'm investing? What do you think? This is a stock that got me into investing, Unfortunately, really? this was your first stock. First stock I read. Oh. I think my dad must have told me, read the financial review, find something you're interested in, go buy it. Yeah. I think I bought Woodside at 15 bucks in about 2005 and right. something something about the oil price or something back then as we're talking about now. Yep. Sold it at 30. Thought I was the best investor <laughs> you would, in history. It's 33 now. <laughs> exactly. Sold it at 30. But uh, yeah, that was. I think it was the first stock I ever bought. Really? Yeah. How long did you hold that for to get that return? I think it was only about 12 or 18 months. Um, and it was a lesson because I sold it and then it did go up to something like 60 bucks at one stage. But over the long term, it's done essentially nothing. Yeah, because that was it, this was a massive like resources boom play like coming into the GFC, right? Like, yeah, it got to what, like $62 or so, 63 bucks in 2007? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So that was the height of the super cycle. Yeah, and now it. And so, if you, if you just look at the the Woodside Energy or Woodside Petroleum before that, if you look at that chart, it's just from that point, just a steady decline. Yeah. Right down into COVID, and then now it's showing some signs of life. For context, what does Woodside Energy do? It's one 
one of, if not Australia's biggest oil and gas producers. Um, huge, huge um, assets off the coast of WA, um, but also just kind of like involved in all of the Asia Pacific region. Um, recently got the oil and gas assets from BHP, which is why it's on a lot of people's watch lists or in their portfolios. Yeah. It's right? a bit of a minnow on a global st- scale, or it was. And yeah. when you add BHP's size to it, it becomes a bit of a, a bigger player globally. Yeah, well, it's thrusted it right at the market cap table. So it's $62 billion at the time of recording. Um, both BHP and Woodside managed to pay huge dividends over the past year. I think for quite separate reasons. I think BHP is obviously iron ore and whatever. Yeah. Bit of a separation of assets there. But with Woodside, we've seen oil prices skyrocketing, which is linked to uh, gas prices. Yep. And Europe in an energy crisis. I mean, it's just your traditional cyclical company. Yeah. And you're seeing a massive cycle at the moment. And I think the question is, does that cycle continue? What do you reckon? Personally, I think while there's a lot of attention being paid to traditional fossil fuels because of the European energy crisis, I think it's a lot of the sector might have gone too far and, you know, every strategy is loading up on them at the moment. But it's still clear, you know, we just had the climate change bill passed in Australia. We've had all kinds of climate and disclosure and energy bills passed overseas. I think it's clear that fossil fuel generally is, mm-hmm. over the long term at least, is going to go into reverse. But what that looks like for the companies is probably a more challenging conversation, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, this is the thing, right? So just to put it in context, we know energy prices in Europe, it's a huge issue. It's a social issue as much as it is financial markets issue, more so. Um, the price that Woodside earned during its first half of 2022 was $96 barrel of equivalent. So that's up from 44 and zero for a while in March 2020. Yeah, exactly. You remember that. Negative, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you think about that, you know, we're seeing a massive expansion of the the realized price, but the costs are still extremely low. And that's what's enabled it to pay a huge dividend. Is it sustainable? Well, I was just looking at the charts of just LNG prices. Um, they're at record highs, like all-time records. So if this is a cyclical business... I mean, I've always seen this as a trading stock. Anything yeah. that's a cyclical that is solely reliant on a, you know, a, sing- a price of one input, it's just a price taker, yeah. well, it's always going to be a trading stock. So it's not something you'd sit in your portfolio for 15 years because, as you can see, it's done nothing for 15. Mm-hmm. It'll have periods where it significantly outperforms, but it'll likely have periods where it significantly underperforms too, and momentum yeah. drives it. Yeah, true. So the, I guess the moral of the story is if you're going to buy a cyclical business, try and buy it at the low. Yeah, I mean, Messy, you, yeah. you could have probably predicted, tried to predict that since 2013, but it wouldn't have worked out for you. So, there's someone told me the old rule is buy when it's got a high PE. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I mentioned that last time as well. Yeah, so now the PE is very low. I think it's yeah. seven or, or lower. That's usually the rule because yeah. earnings are catching up. So, dividends are great, fully franked or thereabouts, and it's you know a great big Australian business. If you do want exposure to resources. Just as an FYI, there is an ETF that does that. I know we're in Australia, there's resources companies everywhere, but there is an ETF. Vanek MVR ETF does do this um, for 35 basis points. They'll put it all together for you. It's worth noting the difference between resources and materials. Yes. Resources subsector is more oil and gas, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So in the um, resources ETF, you've got Woodside as the biggest position, even though BHP is a bigger company. Yeah. So that just gives you a sense of how they're trying to weight things and get that exposure for you. And I, to be honest, that's probably uh, the way I would go about it is just try and take a all a basket approach. But yeah, it's it's got great cash margins at the mine site. It's got to reinvest. It's capital intensive, blah, blah, blah. I just don't think now is the time to look at it. Um, well, the next question comes from Anonymous U. <laughs> Um, so that's the that's the name, wonderful name. Uh, interested in the team's rundown of Infratil. Now, I don't know much about this, Drew, and I saw it's gone from bottom left to top right, so I probably should know a lot more about it than I do. That's why we cram, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yep. 10 minutes out. <laughs> yep. I mean, if Australian Super wants to buy you, you've, you're doing something right and interesting is probably the, hmm. the key case there. Yeah. So I think there was an offer lobbed 2021 maybe by Australian Super to buy the company from memory. Hopefully okay. it... I'll just Google Prove that. me wrong if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want any legal what letters does it coming do? through. Uh, it does a lot of things, and that's kind of the confusing thing. How do you evaluate? So 
mm. uh, renewable energy. They sold Tilt Renewables, but they're funding more and more renewable energy products, um, major, major the projects. Yep. Uh, they own data centers. They do a lot of niche kind of sustainable operations, and they've been buying up so diagnostic imaging like radiology throughout. So I think it's New Zealand listed, yeah, but with an ASX listing as well. $3.8 billion was the takeover offer. Yep. And um, I think that might have been US dollars because it's from Reuters. It's 5.1 billion Aussie. So that's a big deal. Um, it's diversified asset base, super interesting. But if you look at <clears throat> tradition, like something time, like an 80 times PE, so what is it? Is it an infrastructure company? Is it a growth company? Uh, it's always, I wish I bought it before yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When that takeover came around, it's just all the key you know, thematics that are coming through in the next 10 or 20 years, cl- you know, climate change, healthcare, data, it's kind of got an exposure to all of them. Um, it's mm. just a matter of how you price it and what you're willing to pay. Um, yeah, I can see, well, $6.8 billion market cap at the moment. So it looks like in terms of knocking that back, it was the right choice. Yeah. So companies continued on and up and to the right. Um, analysts forecasting pretty decent revenue, EBITDA going forward. So um, really interesting business. I know one of our, um, I know Patrick, a former analyst here at Rask, he wanted to get stuck into it should have at the time now it's my bad um so have you got it in portfolios no we don't it's usually probably a bit small we tend because of because because of our client base we tend to not go outside the 200 i think it's probably just outside the yeah right okay. 200 yeah, we okay. barely go outside the 100 yeah right is that just um, because is it just like div- like liquidity or partially which... liquidity and then coverage so how do you how do you get better research or be close to companies that are in the smaller part of the spectrum that maybe one or two analysts are covering yeah. um, and we're building portfolios for retirees so it's very much a combination of income and solid growth but not necessarily looking for the companies that are you know growing exponentially yeah okay not in not direct as a direct stock anyway yeah, I don't think it pays ranking credits because it's a Kiwi company too. So maybe that's something that keeps a bit of retirees off, um, that keep it off watch lists. So um, yeah, really interesting company. Infratel, if you know something about it, please reach out to us. I, I don't know know enough, but um, it's a yeah, a really interesting business, top top performer. So um, thank you for sending that question in, anonymous you. Don't know who you are, uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you. I think it'll be potentially interesting for more takeover offers too. So if you think about private equity, we got four or five different businesses yeah. in there. Uh, I know so Morrison and Co is like a unlisted infrastructure manager owns a reasonable stake in it, and I'm sure there's always going to be a bit of takeover interest in it. That's the thing. Like a lot of these businesses that do play into that re- renewables, green infrastructure, whatever. There's n- like no end in sight for PE companies that want that in their portfolios or even pension funds. There's a real sort- shortage of that, and there's a lot of demand for it. So really interesting. Okay. Dennis C, and this one's probably one for you, mate. Um, Dennis C asks, what amount should I take off the table? And I think this is in relation to if you have an established portfolio, you're looking to transition, like as in you're thinking about retirement, um, should I be taking money off the table? Now, I met a guy downstairs at Chin Chin a while back who said he's going he to take taking all money off the table until November 2022. I asked him why he didn't have a valid reason, but that's was, that was his theory. Um, was so, he working there? Or was he? No, he was. A, yeah, he seemed like he knew what he was talking about in other respects, but um, he was, seems to be proven right. I don't know if that's. <laughs> it's been pretty volatile, but how much do you take off the table? When do you start thinking about it? All of these questions come to mind. Depends what you want. So, you know, we talk a lot about interest rates going up and the challenge that's prov- that's having on, you know, mortgages or equity markets and, and what returns are doing. But on the other side, it's increasing term deposit, cash rates, and all these low-risk investment options. So, uh, when do you take money off? Depends if you've got enough to mm-hmm. retire or if, you have to keep, if, you, if you're in a position where you have to keep investing to have any hope of, of growing your capital and, and not, you know, running out before the final days. Yeah. The- was, is there like any rule of thumb that you have around what people should have in cash when they try to transition to retirement? In just in, in cash, we generally say 12 months worth of expenses always in cash cash. Yep. Uh, and then you probably have somewhere between, 30, you know, depending on what your objective is, 20 to 30% in lower risk, highly liquid uh, investments. So we see that as, you know, if everything went to shit for <laughs> lack of a better word. Yeah. You've got six or seven years worth of low risk investments you can sell at what they're worth to pay out your income and let your equity portfolio uh, recover. 
um, which is, you know, even in the worst case scenario, even the GFC, it only took about three or four years for most equity portfolios to recover. Yeah, right. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb. Um, then in terms of, I guess, like, so if someone was to have, let's say there's a couple, I know we've done a heap of scenarios on this. So Dennis, if you are listening to this, please go back into the back catalog. You could just do a, a Google search for Rask Investors Podcast, um, Retirement something like this. We did a mini series recently on passive income where I gave you an ex- uh, a hypothetical example as well. So Dennis, go back in, in the archives and look at that. Um, but in terms of if someone had to say 500 grand yeah. and they've got, you know, five years ahead in their working life, um, like would, I'm guessing you would say keep working, save as much as you can, probably put it in super um, and because 500 grand is probably not enough, right? Depends how much you're going to need to, uh, in income afterwards. So I pulled up the CanStar figures, yeah. which is saying, uh, so the difference between what we, we have a rule of thumb that if you, you can generate 5% of your portfolio in income every year and rely on that. So if it was 500, it'd be 25 grand a year. Yep. CanStar solves that to zero. So if right. you live to your life expectancy, how much would you need? It's actually not far off. So if you re- retired at 67, you need about 610,000 to draw an income of 50K. So it's actually not that far off if you want to draw an income of 50. Um, it would include Centrelink as well. Uh, if you retire at 60, it's 743,000. So the, the change is fairly significant. Yeah, it depends on how long you want that income to go. Yeah, but, definitely. I but, mean, what, part of our advice, you know, we, we're talking about trying to reverse retirement and talk about the golden years rather than you know yeah. retirement and yeah. just kind of you know tr- trending off. Uh, and I think a lot of it isn't actually just the investments when it comes to or the, the amount you have in savings when it comes to working. It's actually positive in terms of transitioning into retirement if you have yeah. purpose and keep going back into work. So uh, you can even look beyond the financial part towards, yeah, I think everyone, if they're enjoying it and it's and it's not toiling, then should keep working as long as they can. Yeah, I know there are a bunch of issues around like uh, employment, you know, just it, causation, correlation, lower levels of dementia, these types of things, like a lot of um, social and psychosocial conditions yeah. tend to be put off by um, ma- remaining gainfully employed and doing something like that, having that purpose. Okay, so um, in terms of what amount to take off the table, I think just one final thing on here de- uh, for Dennis is that, um, you know, we if we had a dollar for every time someone comes to us and says the market's about to crash, I'm going to take it all out, <laughs> honestly... It's incredible. We'd be very wealthy. Um, Newspapers don't help. uh, Yeah. The daily news cycle is not playing to your favor, particularly when there's a war in Europe and there's high inflation and a lot of uncertainty. And at the end of the day, you've got your long-term investment portfolio. It's about sticking to it. It's about regularly adding if you're an accumulator, Um, just setting yourself up because we know it's timing the market, not timing the market. And I have to repeat that again and again and again. A lot of people ask that question, but yeah, Com- of course. Yeah, compounding returns are like the most powerful part of investing. And I think one of the big parts is if you're worried about what the potential outcome is from here, it's actually building a portfolio that's exposed to multiple outcomes. Mm-hmm. So not just worrying about if it's inflation, what if there's low inflation, what are the other alternatives and having assets that work well in each. So you, And explaining that is what part of what we do. So mm. people are less likely to make decisions to sell at the worst possible time. Yeah. Yeah, I like it, mate. Um, Archie asks a question. We'll have to be a little bit quick on this one. Sorry, Archie, you've asked. Asking about SKN ASX. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a look at this, Archie, and uh, I th- think it's skin elements. I think, yeah, this yeah. has to be because you said ASX. It's down 82% year over year. Not sorry uh, if I'm joking in my <laughs> tone, but the re- reason that I laugh about it, Archie, is that it's uh, a $7.8 million company, so it is tiny. Um, when you get down to this size... It, this is a private company size, to be honest. And even then, you know, it's not huge. So, um, question would be what's the purpose of being listed? Because it wouldn't be cheap to be on the ASX. Yeah, they'd probably be better off as a private company. But a lot of these things turn into something else. Like someone comes along and cleans it up. But it's, I guess it's down 78% in a year. So, that's probably why it's 7.8%, yeah. 7.8 million market cap. But um, so, yeah, I, I guess I, neither of us really follow this company closely. Um, just pulling up the, the report for the business, um, it looks like, and if I just go down, I'm just jumping through to... It's like disinfectants and 
and yeah. other treatments. Yeah. Uh, revenue up 387% to 1.4 million. Uh, still reporting a loss of 1.6 million. Um, if we just go to the balance sheet, when it comes to these micro caps, the first thing or nano caps, the first thing I look at is cash flow, you know, risk on the balance sheet. Um, has bugger all in the way of borrowing, so that's good. Um, it's got a fair bit in receivables, but in terms of assets versus liabilities, it's pretty strong from the outset. In terms of cash flow, I mean, it's reporting a loss, so $1.5 million cash outflow. And um, it's only got uh, $748,000 of cash at the end of the year. So if it keeps going backwards, it needs to keep raising capital. That's yep. the moral of the story. So, more dilution and, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, can't be any more, we can't be any more help to you. Archie, maybe uh, check out our friends at Strawman and see if any of the private investors over there have something to offer. But um, very small company, so it should be uh, approached as such. And um, when we're building diversified portfolios, this is definitely well outside where it, um, you know, our core portfolios. Position sizing is key. Yep. Keep it small. Yep. Uh, Charbs asks. Oh, no, you're going to skip the, oh, the, the, the bingo. bingo. Yeah, bingo, bongo, wallafella. So that was... Um, and then the message was, uh, Owen is cool and this is a test by me. So that was <laughs> that was actually me testing. The <laughs> you weren't getting enough questions? Is that yeah, why you did it? Like, yeah. Is anyone answering, asking questions? <laughs> yeah. We need to put questions in the next month. No, uh, so what happens is whenever I do like tests for our, if I'm anything develop, developing something on the website, I never make it test one, two, three. I never, I always make it fun. So if someone in our team comes across it, <laughs> it looks strange. Um, so if... There's a thing on our, for all, there's like a dozen accounts with like um, the username uh, Juan Hernandez Garcia, uh, and people always well, like, well, what does this mean? And it's actually just the the fake name that I set up for all the test accounts. <laughs> <laughs> so they think someone's spamming. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so Charles asks, can you briefly explain what is the Beta Shares Global Royalties ETF? R O Y L. You got my yeah. ribs again. <laughs> Uh, Drew's uh, just for those of you that aren't watching Drew does have something going on with his ribs so every time he laughs it hurts so I'll try and keep it as funny as possible <laughs> so R-O-Y-L is this new ETF from BetaShares details sparse um, <laughs> you could say so uh, this ETF by the PR announcements here's what it says ROYL will provide cost-effective exposure to a portfolio of global companies that earn substantial revenue through royalty income, royalty-related income, and intellectual property income, including mining royalties and IP intangible royalties. So, well, I guess royalties are just the things that people uh, or companies earn or certain institutions earn for, you know, mining tenements, for um, like intellectual property as it relates to like creative arts for pharmaceuticals. If they don't want to produce themselves, they'll just outsource and collect the royalty. And so this happens quite frequently. And there are ETFs overseas that do something similar to this in the United States. It's a bit more of a developed industry in that royalties tend to spin off from infrastructure assets, from a bunch of different things, and you can invest in them separately. But this ETF, based on what I can read online... It's marketed as invest in David Bowie and all this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's just going to invest in companies that have royalty, royalty streams. Royalty streams. Yep. So we don't really have that much information. I couldn't find a PDS. I don't know if you found anything. And the closest thing you'll see is doTERRA. So DRR yeah. listed on the ASX. Uh, and I think a lot of these royalties are owned by companies, whether it's Sony, if you're talking about David Bowie, you know, probably not Sony, yeah. or BHP, they own, they'd have royalty streams over multiple assets that they own, some of them own personally too. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, essentially you're just looking like a bond or a, yeah. if you think about it, that uh, every time a David Bowie song plays, you get paid, the company gets paid one cent. Uh, and then the challenge of that is how do you value a bond that's determined by usage mm. and not necessarily price, usually volume for mining. How do you determine a value and what's your discount rate? Um, and who's determining the discount rate because that can change incredibly quickly. So doTERRA trades on, I think they've only got a few royalties doTERRA. Yeah, um, I'm not familiar. I know at a high level what the business does. It does yeah. like uh, resources royalties, right? A couple so. of iron ore royalties, I think. Yeah, right. Uh, and it trades on a PE of 12, so not particularly expensive, not not overly cheap either. But mm -hmm. you know, you, you're constantly going to get cash flow from it. Maybe it's a little bit variable each year. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, what's what's the value? If, if bond yields go up, does it devalue that income stream significantly? 
um, and I assume there's eventually legislative risk. Mm. One of the things, I guess there's two things that I thought about when I started reading articles about this ETF is, the first is if it's giving you uh, exposure through companies, probably the number one thing is how do they filter companies? So how do they filter like companies? Do they have to earn X percent of revenue or is it something else? Yep. Um, what index are they tracking? Yeah. How yep. do they actually do get the exposure and what ends up in the portfolio is probably going to be very, it could go to one extreme or the other. You could end up with a portfolio that looks very similar to a lot of other ETFs, just with a different skin. Yeah. So you want to know exactly what's in it, what's in the filtering process. Um, and at the end of the day, something that we always uh, emphasize is that you're going to be taking equity market risk. Because you're investing in companies, it doesn't matter what they do, you're still going to be taking the risk, just like the uh, market risk of the stock market. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's probably not as pure as what people are thinking. Like saying that it's like you're investing in David Guaranteed Bowie. Guaranteed income. Yeah. Yeah, or something like that. You, there's a lot between style. that marketing and what you're actually getting. Um, so there's got, I would imagine there's going to be high amounts of tracking error and something like this, just as guessing. And it's probably going to be a fairly substantial fee. We don't know the details, but I mean, yeah. There, yeah, there's a few things I could say about it, but I just think keep your... Keep your like your eyes open to what you actually get inside the ETF, and without knowing much detail, I'd say it's not necessarily something I'd be looking to put in a core portfolio. I like to wait a couple of years. It definitely would sit on the satellite, and I would think it would be quite a momentum yeah. driven. You know, during periods of volatility, I'm sure these royalty streams would become attractive. And then when when it settles down, like the the share price of Deterra as an example, it's just constantly flowing, yep. kind of sentiment driven. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like a shark tooth, isn't it? If you zoom out a bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I hope that helps in some way uh, get to that question there, Sharbs. Um, just also be mindful of the marketing that goes into these ETFs. There are numerous studies that show that thematic ETFs, typically the worst time to invest in them is at the start. So um, just don't be afraid to be a little bit patient. Um, I don't really know what happens in the short term, but you know there are a few studies that show um, the best time to launch an ETF is when there's peak uh, investor interest. So, um, Warden Munger Buffett. Uh, actually, so this is a good question from Warden Munger Buffett. There's a lot of energy questions coming through. I was wondering if you could cover Ample. Their 2022 report was released a few days ago, and they have doubled their profits in the last year. So, was, I believe it was a half-year report, um, but that's okay. Um Company's been in and out of the news, Ample, for well, the last few years in particular because of the rebranding in particular. Yeah. I don't know if you know much about it. What do they used to be called? Caltex. Caltex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, so this, this has been in and out of the news. Firstly, like a couple of years ago, I'm not even going that far back, all of the big um, like uh, oil refineries here in Australia were really under pressure because yep. they were getting swamped by cheap fuel and oil out of Asia and our Australian refiners just couldn't pay for their you know facilities yeah and now all of a sudden energy prices have skyrocketed and all of these businesses all of a sudden are reporting as you say uh Warden Munger Buffett uh, they're reporting huge profits so again this is a capital intensive business P ratio looks like it's graded eight times um yield decent but You've got to be mindful of the fluctuations in oil prices. How long will we stay this high? Don't know. Really? Yeah, I think their royalty margins just surged significantly, didn't they? Yeah. During, or not royalty, the refining margins. That's the thing, um, yeah. And then political pressure came on that. And But just not long before, they were seeking subsidies, weren't they, just to... Yeah, just to keep it on care and maintenance. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, it, from a national security perspective, we want businesses like this to be a success so we can produce a lot of our own oil here in Australia, we produce enough of it. Let's refine it here in Australia as well. Rather than sending it to yeah Singapore, isn't it? Where we but during um, during COVID, all of these businesses. I remember because I went on Sky Biz and talked about this that a lot of these businesses were shuttering refineries because they just couldn't keep up with uh, it, like imports from Asia. So you know, in the space of two years, we've gone from worst case scenario to Goldilocks, and that's just serving as a reminder for us that we've got to be mindful of how capital intensive these businesses are, what they do with their capital when they are in a good period, 
like I think Woodside paid two billion, two point one billion dollars of dividends. Um, but they're huge. They've got huge capex bills and opex, which is operating expenditure. So I just be mindful that you, the last thing you want to do is buy at the top. A lot of these businesses will still be around for another ten years, and you might be able to get a better chance to buy them. I mean, the <clears throat> the market clearly doesn't believe that it's sustainable because the PE is ten. It's not telling you they expect a significant yeah. amount of growth. Um, so it could be that you're buying it. Not that it's going to fall off a cliff. It doesn't mean it's going to fall off a cliff, but that. All the, it's had the near perfect operating conditions, uh, and, it, and it's probably going to be challenging to keep up with expectations for the next few years. Could well be that it just pumps out income for a few years. Well, um, analysts are currently forecasting pretty strong top line growth, so uh, and along with pretty strong dividends for the next two years. But a lot of when you invest in the stock market, there are effectively two valuations you need to understand. One is the the, the valuation between now and say five years into the future. And then the, the valuation from five years on, which we call the terminal value. That's basically like saying, what's the valuation between now and when I can sell it? And what price do I get when I sell it? And for a lot of these resources companies, the hard part is estimating what happens in year five onwards, because that's when you'll get the majority of your capital returned to you as an investor. I personally don't like the uncertainty. So I prefer businesses that are in control of their prices, typically not selling commodities, typically not relying on government subsidies or anything like that. Definitely. Yep. Great question though, because I think this is this is why we do this. We wouldn't ordinarily talk about a lot of these uh, resources or resources linked companies. And uh, Ample is a great business. You can go into the servos and it's great. Like I went, was there on the weekend. Yeah. And um, it's wonderful. But uh, from an investment perspective, I just prefer more predictable business models. The next question comes from And, and I'm not sure if this is the actual is A N D. It's a capital A though, so maybe it was on purpose. Um, and says, what website can I use to compare different companies' accumulated returns, both capital and income growth? I've seen you use it, Owen, on your podcast, but I can't remember its name. So I'm happy to fill in here. So the accumulated returns are important because a lot of websites uh, just retort, re- report price returns. Like our website just reports price returns. And benchmarks reinvest dividends. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Exactly. So you can see, like if you compare, say, I don't know, some like an index um, to a stock, you might miss out on a lot of the dividends. And that's typically what is explained. Uh, four out of every $10 from the stock market typically comes from dividends in Australia. So you're missing a huge part. Now, Market Index, which is the most popular website for this type of thing, I, it just says return on its website. I don't think it says anything else. The one that's probably most accessible is Morningstar. Yeah. So Morningstar- Total uh, shareholder return. Yeah. yeah. And if you just- uh, you don't have to like log in for this. If you do log in, um, you can see more. But you should just go search for the company, go trailing returns. Like Telstra, over 10 years has, in total return terms, over 10 years has returned 5.1%. The index, 9.4%. So not very good for Telstra. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even though it plays a great dividend. Maybe once you include franking credits. You... you can compare it to CSL. There's plenty of charts that show total shareholder return. Yeah. Uh, why don't I just bring that up? income. Yeah. Um, and- I think you're doing the right thing. Like, there in Australia, one of the things that we try and push people to on our websites is, um, I think it's XTN is it is the index symbol, which is the ASX 200 total returns. Yeah. Then you can adjust as well. There is an index from S and P that adjusts for franking credits. So there's yes, yeah, that's the challenge that uh, it can depend on your tax rate. Yeah. How you're measuring. If you're in a zero tax environment, then you get the whole return, but they're probably wary of reporting it because everyone has a different tax rate. For sure. And that's like managed funds, which we can talk about all day, about turnover and about liquidity events, all this sort of stuff. Um, CSL, total return, 22% per year over 10 years versus the index 9.4. Pretty impressive. Not bad. So uh, that's how you do it. And um, just be aware <laughs> of a lot of the websites. I don't think Ticker does total return either. So um, We yeah. use a system called Xplan owned by Iris, which yep. is an advice platform. Uh, and that allows us to kind of track historically, but also forward and re- reports income and growth and an internal rate of return for every investment. Hmm. So it pulls it apart. Yeah, it pulls it apart, and we report to clients every quarter. Oh, cool. So yeah, because and then there's, there'll be other things like fact set, and I'm sure Cap IQ, the actual Cap IQ, can do it, but more professional yeah, services. But you're yeah. going to be paying quite a bit, kind of, for that. So you can just use Morningstar for free. That's uh, on their website. So, oh, sorry, not kind of and. The next one is from Connor who asks, what pathway would you recommend for someone wanting to become a professional investment analyst, specifically for someone who is looking to change professions 
having already studied in a non-finance field? Great question. Do, do you have Another a challenging one? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, you know what? So I know you like the Animal Spirits podcast. There was a question that they dealt with, I think it was about five years ago or so, back when the podcast first started. And the question from someone writing in was, well, would you do the CFA or the CFP? Now, quite different things. Yep. CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst Designation, CFP, Certified Financial Planner. You've done the CFP. Yep. Would you do it Very again? Very different. Yeah, I think I'd do it again. It's more, I feel like it's more broad based. I did the first unit of CFA. Yeah. Failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> and took a career in a different, completely different direction. <laughs> That's it. I'm going so to finance. Tried both. <laughs> <laughs> Financial planning. <laughs> I was actually unemployed. So I tried to do the CFA for a while. I bought $1,000 worth of books, which I still have most of. Oh, good uh, reference. And then switched back to financial advice when, when I joined the business I'm in now. Um, I mean, I'm kind of anti-extra education yeah, <laughs> to right. some point like every single person we meet now is a cfa yeah uh, or um you know and just gonna hopefully not too many people listening to it <laughs> but like there's so much experience you get from doing rather than than yeah. studying and there's some quotes out there that talk about you know most mba you know most people that have run a small business have got more business knowledge than mm. people with an mba i'm gonna get in so yeah, much yeah, trouble you're gonna get that. <laughs> <laughs> um I think the natural start's got to be applied finance. Having a basic understanding of how financial markets work, if you haven't done a commerce degree yeah. or a business degree, incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you really want to be an analyst working for a fund manager, you don't have a choice. You have to have a CFA, yeah. essentially, or, yeah. an, or a pension fund or anything. Yeah. Uh, if, you're in, if you want to go to the United, uh, United Kingdom, um, you basically have to have CFA level two to speak to retail clients. Yeah. Um, you can, there are other ways to do it, but that's the standard that it's got to. And the UK economy and the financial regulator is very stringent. So it gives you a sense of kind of how, how they think about things. But I actually, because I, you know, I teach like a value investing program and all that, I actually did a study on this quite a while ago. And I just surveyed, you know, from publicly available data, the top buy side funds. So when you go into investing and in, in particular in um, funds management, there are two sides that you can go to. There's the buy side, which is like fund managers like we've had on the show. Like if you think of Monroe Partners, Magellan, all that stuff. They're on the buy side. They're actively deciding which shares they want to buy and include in their portfolio. That's pretty much the gold standard for most people that are an analyst. On the other side, we have the sell side. The sell side includes brokers. It includes investment banks that publish research on companies that you might not want to own yourself or your boss might not want to own their fund. But it's still an important part because that research gets fed out to financial planning groups, to wealth management groups, so on and so forth. And when I looked at this, for all undergraduate degrees, uh, for all degrees overall, basically every, like it was like 65% of the people that, and the funds that I looked at, both fund, both analysts and portfolio managers, 65% had the Bachelor of Commerce, 22% um, had partially completed the Masters of Applied Finance and 28%. CFA. Now, if we just look at portfolio managers, 70% had the Bachelor of Commerce, 40% CFA charter holder, and 21% had got part of the way through their Masters of Applied Finance. So what does this mean? Well, I honestly think that if you're going to move into finance, and in particular investment research, and you want to work for one of these funds, like Drew says, you probably need to, it's table stakes for a lot of these places. Um, personally, I would love to see someone with experience. A lot, of, whether that's in finance or not, you basically just need to prove your wares. Yeah. Do you understand how to build a cash flow? Just kind of cash flow analysis. Do you understand valuation? Do you speak the jargon? Um, I get a lot of questions on this. I would. The Masters of Applied Finance is great. The best ones through Macquarie um, Uni. Uh, it does take it out. Of you. I think it's Saturdays and and weeknights, which would be brutal. You can do like Kaplan or something like that online. Not as prestigious, but you get the job done. Uh, and I always say to people, there are so many applicants for these jobs, like so many, but you need to prove your experience. Even if you're a seasoned, an older person that's been doing this for a while, start an anonymous blog, jump onto Twitter, try and connect with people, do some deep dives, um, just prove that you can do it. And there's more PMs and fund managers thinking in different directions now. So yeah. it's not just straight up analysts, but there's, you know, ESG analysts who focus on a different part. Great point. Yeah. There's there's groups that actively employ 
intelligent people from different sectors like mathematics yep. or um, you know psychology, yep. but all kinds of random parts. So invest a fund manager looking for an edge in every part of their business. So um, yeah, just having some experience. I just said start investing. It's yeah. the easiest way. And sometimes, like you said, yeah, you just start investing. But you, like you just alluded to, you can find a, a side door into one of these places. Yeah. Chance are you're going to have to do the things that the other analysts or PM doesn't want to do. So maybe that means you have half your week is like as a BDM. A lot of those smaller boutique funds start up that way. Yeah, they might have someone that understands finance but can do the selling as well. Speak with financial planners, go out and um, prepare documents, do all that sort of stuff as well. Um, because if you get in on the ground floor on one of these boutique funds that ends up doing uh, like brilliant numbers in terms of you know market beating returns for five or ten years, just being there on day one or thereabouts is going to be a huge advantage to you. You're gonna you're gonna earn very well, but you're also going to you know build a name for yourself regardless. Yeah, definitely. So ha- there will be a link in the show notes to this um, little brief study that I did. But um, so just in summary, you've got to speak the language. So that means getting something on your CV that says you can do it. If you come from a different discipline like engineering or something, that can actually be to your advantage if you find the right fund managers. So kind of great question and good luck with that. Uh, Francis says, uh, solid name, by the way, like this one's probably sensible name, Francis. Um, I'd like to hear your view on the CLW Charter Hall Long Whale REIT. Thoughts? Don't mind it. It's uh, mm. part of our model. Yeah. Uh, super interesting. We've always... You know, Drew loves REITs was your initial comment here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't don't love REITs. <laughs> they're, they're, they I are, <laughs> they I mean, they're, they can be, a if the timing's right, I think they can be a great way to get exposure to a specific sector or asset class, um, particularly, you know, given the fact that they they publish their net asset value. So you can get, an, mm. you can usually buy them at a discount to what they're worth. So, I mean, Charter Whale, 550-odd properties, 7 billion uh, ninety nine point nine percent. Um, hmm. what's it? Non vac. What's the uh, no, least? Essentially, no vacancy. Yeah. Uh, and an average. So long whale just means weighted average lease expiry, which means there's twelve years on average to each of their leases comes up. And the portfolio is everything from logistics centres, so like Woolworths to service stations, mm-hmm. uh, all around Australia. I think some in New Zealand. Um, we it's in our models. Uh, it's performed poorly the last few months. Essentially. Investors have sold it off on concerns that the valuation rate or the cap rate, which is about 4.35%, is going to be impacted by higher bond yields. Mm. So if bond yields are higher, term deposits are higher, people want to pay less for property. So at 4.35, they're suggesting it's it's overvalued and the net asset value kind of shows that. It's net asset value is $6.17 and it's trading about four ninety eight or so, so a mm. significant discount to net asset value. Um, I think... It's one of those stocks that gets caught up in in the bond yield sell off. You know, it's property, it's bond yield driven. Let's get out, and that's why there's a pricing differential. Whereas the types of assets they're holding aren't selling at thirty mm. percent discounts. They're just they're barely even trading if they are, mm. or they're selling at reasonable prices. So. Well, they got long whales, so not exactly. really selling. You don't need to sell have to. Yeah, exactly. So would you then? That all sounds pretty compelling. Would you then, if you were thinking about this investment now, it's a long way from its NTA. Would you wait until you you get some sort of? I mean, I know you you have it. In- I think it's a long term. You could buy it now and hold it for a decade if you wanted to. It's quality assets constantly turning over. They're always acquiring more. They're pretty. Chuddle is pretty aggressive in in finding new assets, and people are still keen for it. Mm. How about so we um we've had a few folks on the show not too long ago talking about this and talking about how uh, some REITs have like inflation protection built into them so they can adjust and so on and so forth. I, so you think you can just kind of like add this to a portfolio, you can take a regular distribution. Um, you don't necessarily need to wait for, I guess, bond prices to stabilize and then wait for it to- They kind of already up. have. So they, you know, bond yield, 10-year bond yield peaked at 10, 4% or close to 4 and it's back at about 3.2 or 3.3 now. So yeah. the, the bond market's telling you something slightly different. And I think people are starting to get concerned that the economy may not be as resilient yeah. as it is, and inflation may actually fall off pretty quickly if you know things like 
rent and uh, oil fall in the US particularly. Yeah. So I think there's always a risk that bond yields keep going up and they keep selling it off and there's a negative view on the sector. But I think it's in the right thematics and and sectors at the moment and you're getting a pretty good deal. It's probably a question of when you sell it. You'd probably sell it closer to NTA. Mm. Yeah, okay. I like it because we hear a lot about cap rates um, getting squeezed, but it's probably we're probably there now. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's um, just need to wake up and you realize that. But um, okay, interesting. Because and so maybe I'll just be very selfish and throw one more question here, mate. So in a portfolio, is there like a an upper bound for how much you would want in REITs, generally speaking? Like I imagine, it a lot probably of depends how. Like we generally say, a listed stock would be half the level of a managed fund because it's less diversified. Mm -hmm. This sort of thing, where it holds five hundred fifty properties, where well, you can't get much more diversified mm. than that. Uh, I mean, we usually cap direct holdings anywhere from sort of two to four percent of a portfolio, okay. just on volatility. As you see, it's down thirty percent, so you don't want to hold thirty percent in your portfolio that that might fall like that. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, good, good one. Great question, Francis. Um, investing bandit. <laughs> That's a name. I like that investing bandit. <laughs> uh, very simple question too. Advice on ABB reporting season. So this is Aussie Broadband, does over-the-top internet connections. Aussie Broadband, great customer service. Am an advocate. Don't get paid to say that, <laughs> but I am a, an avid customer and I, I love the service from Aussie Broadband. If you haven't already tried them, it's worth a crack. Uh, so Aussie Broadband uh, is listed on the stock exchange. Hasn't been listed for too long. Started out life below two bucks a share, rose rapidly uh, up until early this year, being 2022, to around about $5.90, and it has collapsed recently to $2.46, so it's halved. Um, thing is, still achieving very strong growth, still posting you know higher and higher revenue numbers. Um, estimates going forward are very strong top line growth, very strong top line growth and also earnings per share growth. So analysts are guiding for much stronger growth. I think maybe this is a, a, partially, this is something to do with increasing competition, but also people thinking, well, how much faster can it grow, right? What price are we prepared to pay for this? Did it get ahead of itself? Yeah, probably. It's very growth oriented in a inflationary environment. Perfect, it, perfectly timed IPO, I think, wasn't it as well? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you have closely follow it, but um, Aussie Broadband off opened the offer to their broadband subscribers. And I think that was oversubscribed, that component of it. Yeah. Because people just wanted, they just couldn't get enough. So if you are a company with significant brand loyalty, I think there's a lesson to take away here, which is that um, use your mailing list to sell your stock. Um, yeah. You know, engage people that way because they've done such a good job of it. So in FY22, revenue rose to 547 million from 350. EBITDA is 39.4. That's normalized from 39. Um, so in terms of residential connections, up from 363,000 to 464. Total services at 738,000 from 525. So this, is, this for the most, in, for all intents and purposes, this is a company that has offered a service that is commoditized and yeah. it's done it in a way that has really just caught on with people. Yeah. Um, and so you can see why customers love it and it's recommending a lot of their friends and yeah, it's, it's kind of taken off. I feel like, uh, you know, the NBN, uncertainty around the NBN has probably been hurting it as well. Yeah, it kind of fell into the tech growth basket when it listed. Yeah. But if you see, <clears throat> you know, the NBN stop looking at trying to make profit and cut wholesale costs, well, they've got an opportunity to extract more profit and cash flow. I assume that's what, what investors or the market's worried about at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's super competitive market, but brand loyalty is something you pay for and whether they can expand that into multiple other sectors eventually. Mm. So um, I tell you who, I tell you Investing Bandit who uh, follows this company really closely. There's a company called Lachlan Burr Jensen. He is on Twitter, writes for the Inside Network and Rask occasionally. Um, so it's Lachlan. You'll find him on Twitter. Great question on Aussie Broadband. I think as a you know a growth company in this type of cycle, you've got to understand the powers that, that, that play. Where does it sit in its competitive landscape? And one of the things that you can do to determine the kind of pricing power or lack thereof of companies is to do something called a Porter's Five Forces. I don't know if you've ever used this. This is like where you look at a company from, it's basically four different angles. Yeah. So you look at it from competitive strength, 
um, supplier strength, customer strength. And you look at it from all these different angles and you look at a company and you try and determine who in this uh, value chain has the power. And um, when you're over the top like this, you basically have to get your competitive advantage through intellectual property, through your cu- yeah, yeah. customers. So how, like you've got to pay a lower multiple for a company that doesn't have true pricing power. Steve-O asks, of all, potential, uh, of all potentially oversold companies in the past 12 months, what are your thoughts about Newix? I'm not allowed to comment on this one. No? Former? I bought it twice. <laughs> <laughs> what pre-IPO? I hope? No, 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 not a pre-IPO. <laughs> After it fell the first time. Oh wow! So yeah. you just caught but it. The thing again, is, if and then again, pre-IPO you're still down ninety. If you bought it after it fell, you're still down eighty-five percent. So yeah. So Newex does uh, software for um, investig- investigative data analysis. So. If you're a company like ASIC, which is the Australian uh, financial regulator, you might use data, um, use this service. They sell it on a subscription, but also as modules and as like licenses. The company is transitioning to selling via subscription and consumption-based usage, which is a, a, a play to try and get it in into kind of, I guess, a more scalable business model where it can grow and without really having to do much. The thing that really... Uh, you should know when you look at a company like this is when a company that sells a lot of software, you've got to look at the um, income statement and you've got to compare that to the cash flow statement because this company actually, if I'm not mistaken, capitalizes a lot of its intellectual property and the spend on uh, R&D. So you can see looks like great profitability because it's capitalizing a lot. And then you look at the cash flow statement and you see the cash outflows and you're like, well, Okay, material, you also see a lot of amortization. So my advice is don't necessarily look at something like EBITDA, maybe look at proper free cash flow from the cash flow statement before Definitely. you make an inference about the company's performance. Don't buy falling knives is the other. Dead cat bounce, don't buy a falling knife. Yes. <laughs> so, Just 101 of investing. So if you don't know the context around Newix, Newix is a, as I just painted the picture, that sounds like a pretty interesting software company, should be like growth focused, blah, blah, blah. IPO'd by Macquarie. Um, subsequently crashed and crashed in a spectacular way. There's a lot of news that we don't need to maybe get into about um, what happened around the time of the IPO, about prospectus forecasts, about insiders, class actions currently underway, um, which obviously always hangs over the top. But in terms of the the business uh, as kind of just a general look and feel, New CEO, um, new chair, I believe. So you're getting into- Super interesting business. Super interesting business. One of the things to keep in mind when a company's been in it, not necessarily private equity, but it kind of is with Macquarie. um, If it's been in a situation like that, you've always got to know who you're buying from when it comes to IPOs. And if you're buying from a company that is extremely intelligent, like Macquarie is, got a lot of sharp people there, how, like, what's your advantage in understanding the business? <laughs> Sorry, Drew. <laughs> you didn't buy in the IPO. You bought, Not in the IPO. You, you yeah. post IPO. You're catching it. It's undervalued. What's that sa- saying? It still it's, is. Turn around, sell them, turn. Um, but, but if you look at it, the business itself these days, there's a lot of stock held by Macquarie still. But if you look at it, I think it's about 160 million, Drew. I could be mistaken off the top of my head in terms of uh, the ACV, which is the... Um, contracted value. And so if you look at that, yeah, it's about 160 million. Um, and the business isn't actually that big anymore because it has fallen so far. Yeah. So you're getting down to kind of like deep value territory on a business that should be getting better. So the value, the classic value play is you buy a company that's not as bad as people think. This is probably the one. Yeah. I mean, the lesson for me, yeah, yeah, is... Uh, Get your core right and position <laughs> size appropriately. And I think, you know, stop losses are difficult in a core portfolio, but I think if you're going to have a- X200 kind of stocks, maybe it was in the 200, uh, have a stop loss in yeah. at, outside of, you know, in, in your speculative kind of holdings. Yeah. And that's where this business would probably fit. So just from, um, I don't know if this includes unlisted stock, so I don't know where this data comes from. Uh, 250 mil market cap uh, against a 
annualized contract value of around uh, 140. Um, as I said, though, on a free cash flow basis, it went negative last year because you, it looks like on paper, it looks like an EBITDA, you know, a pretty you know, positive, right? But if you get down to the cash flow statement and you deduct, you know, everything that's not included in that kind of uh, amortized R&D, um, you get to, what is it? Even just deducting, so $30 million cash receipts, deduct $51 million for net investing cash flows. Um, I don't know if it's got any leases to disclose, uh, $2.7 million. So you're going backwards to the tune of about $25 million a year. Yep. Um, they're investing heavily, they say, in new technologies to try and add on packages. Interesting at these levels, Steve. Interesting, definitely more interesting than it was. <laughs> Sorry, Drew. I'm just, Don't make me laugh. I'm just closing out. <laughs> Drew here. I'm just looking into the screen at you, Steve-O. Um, you know, interesting. Definitely. S- I, I still like the company. Obviously, uh, growth expectations got ahead of uh, where they actually were. They great at, clearly great at parts of what they do. So, yeah. Yeah. I can't give you a buy on it, though. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's extremely volatile. So, it could be one of those ones where it does turn um, because it's got such a loyal customer base. But there's two sides to every business. They've got to clean up that cost side of their their balance of their income statement uh, and the cash flow. I'd want to see it cash flow positive. There's a, there's a thing, Steve, that, you know, there's a saying that turnaround seldom turn. You can wait for a company to turn typically before you look at reinvesting into it. So keep that in mind. All right. Final question. We've been through a lot today, Drew, which is build. This is from Building Wealth in Silence. <laughs> That's a great name. It's probably, that's probably the, a podium finish. Building Wealth in Silence says, best exposure ETFs to India. I love it how people are just like very concise with their words. <laughs> Give Google. us the <laughs> keywords. Um, so, best exposure to India. Now, if you go back in time, just quickly, if you go back in time and you Google ETF securities India, the first... Thing that pops up that's not their website is this podcast channel where we interviewed Kanish Chug. So you can go and you can hear it straight from Kanish. Um, but there are two ETFs as far as I couldn't, unless it's like active listed funds, I couldn't see any others. Oh, there's a group called India Avenue, I think, which is a, oh, India a, Avenue, a, yeah. a fund manager or a managed fund, not an ETF. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, I think they're based in Sydney, India Avenue. Yeah. And the way that, because I met with those guys, and the way that that fund works is. Actually, context matters here. So, when you invest in India, uh, it's a little bit different to US equities and things like that. To invest up until a little while ago, to invest in India, you needed to be in India or be you know an Indian citizen and those types of things. It changed recently because the markets became a little bit more open. But uh, India Avenue, um, they actually used uh, their portfolio managers and everything was on the ground in India, and the Australian vehicle kind of just invested through them. Yeah. Um, I'm not 100% sure how the beta shares one works, but there are two options on the ASX. Did you, did you know much about these or do you want me to riff for a little while? You can. I'll have a slightly different view. Okay. Yeah. There are two ETFs uh, that invest here. There's the ETF Securities ETF, which is slightly lower fee than the beta shares one. They launched about the same time, by the way. Um, and the, the ETF from uh, beta shares is basically... It, 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 it's it's a fundamental ETF, so it's not traditional market cap weighted, meaning that it invests in things like um, low debt to equity, um, really playing into that quality factor, return on equity, and those types of things. Whereas the ETF securities one invests in just traditional uh, top 50 stocks. Very similar names in the top 10 holdings, if you do look at them, because it is a quite top-heavy index, um, even though there are quite a few listed entities it is a quite a top heavy index like some of those middle eastern stock exchanges as well where there are a few names that are relevant around the world but then not much beyond that yeah um so you could invest in either of those personally the the, the beta shares etf is actually bigger um which i'm surprised about because i feel like the etf securities just they're very, splitting hairs a bit here but i feel like the etf securities etf may be a better quality etf in terms of more pure index. Yeah, more yeah. pure. Like if you're looking to cash in on India, it's just – there are some criticisms about using a market cap weighted. I know that there are in some of these emerging markets, but it's very simple and it's a bit lower cost and you kind of know what you're going to get. And obviously, India is a very attractive uh, economy because it's growing so fast and things like IT and that are huge. So I don't know. The, I guess the question here, Drew, was – 
which these ETFs, I'd probably err on the side of the um, ETF securities ETF. It has performed slightly better. Both of them have huge tracking error, the difference between the fund and the index. That's my riff. I probably agree with you, and probably it's probably worth giving context. When we build a portfolio, we're more likely to buy Asia yeah. that has an exposure to India. Yeah. I think because there's, uh, there is, I mean, not uncertainty, it's a lot of concentration into a single economy, similar to doing it here as well. Yeah. So we'll always look at a, look for an Asia strategy rather than emerging markets and one that has a significant exposure to India, anywhere from 50, 15 to 30%. Um, I've always found that interesting because you, you essentially you're buying demographic trends and societal trends that are similar across the region. Um, and we tend to find it less volatile when you go, multiple countries rather than just one economy yeah yeah boring uh, yeah no i agree I, I guess the question is if you're in, investing in india directly you the thing i'm guessing the thing that building wealth in silence here wants is purely to get growth and so this should probably be in your satellite exposure if it's anywhere rather than you know broad based because you're taking a lot of country risk you're taking um currency risk so you want to make sure that um your position size is accordingly and in i don't know about you drew but just as a kind of broad strokes it's not maybe it's not very friendly to say this but i actually do prefer in some instances i do prefer active management in some of these countries yeah because there is still um inefficiencies that can be exploited definitely it's not always the case you don't just go and buy any fund manager but the fmex managed fund which is listed on the stock exchange that's from fidelity they do a lot of work in emerging markets, so I'd encourage you to go check that one out as well. Um, List of product, yes, um, but it provides an active exposure. Yeah, definitely. I'd share share your view. It's it's inefficient. Most of these countries mm. award which rewards active should reward active management. Should reward, yeah, for the most part. It's more yeah. You're going to get information, or maybe not information symmetry, but you're going to get uh, benefits of these economies and these stock exchanges not having the same coverage. You know, a better appreciation of governance. One of the big reasons, and a lot of people overlook this, that Austral- the Australian stock market has been the best performing in the world is because of our governance and our kind of getting to being a first world country and um, being resource-, resource rich, of course, which protects, protected by property rights. It's a very fruitful place to invest. So that's where having that expertise on the ground, people that understand when it's not so clear cut, which companies are going to manage that and profit. Um, it's useful definitely cool so that's a very 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 long episode Drew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you do have a question please send it in to us um, if you like the format please let us know on Twitter LinkedIn wherever you get uh, your social media you can send a question through to us there'll be a link in your podcast player so you can do that now you can also get in touch with Drew at waddlepartners.com.au there's a contact us page there go and check that out uh, if you're interested in financial planning doesn't matter where you are in the country I think you're jetting off to Adelaide. Adelaide and Perth this week, yeah. Adelaide and Perth. So the man can get on a plane. <laughs> he has done it before. Um, and then to Noosa. In, in October, Noosa. yeah. Yeah, Noosa in October. So, geez, all the good places. So uh, be sure to get in contact with Drew. You can find me on Twitter at Owen Rask or you can head to the website and find out more about what we do. Drew, mate, absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Always a pleasure. Thanks.